We are absolutely thrilled to have Travis Chambers with us, one of our former students. He was here when I first came and has built an amazing company that he sold and now is building another amazing company. And he came in from southern Utah. He drove all the way in and he got in a serious traffic jam in Ogden. So, Travis, we're glad you made it. He's, he missed most of our dinner, but he's here. Um, the first night when I spoke, I told you about some principles in common to most of the entrepreneurial ventures that we see. Do you remember that? There's a list of things that seem to pop up over and over again. And if you think of Emily's lecture last time, the first one was to have a really strong, driving, motivating purpose that keeps you going through the hard times, which she did. Then you work with incredible tenacity and perseverance because you believe in your purpose, so you don't quit when you have lots of reasons to quit. Then you build some mentors and a team around you. And then you're very, very frugal. Notice, you remember that she, uh, they funded with cash flow, uh, no debt whatsoever. They still have no debt today, a very large multi-million dollar company with no debt. And then the interesting thing is she pivoted. We, every company pivots about three times before they actually gain traction. Can you tell me what she first started selling? What was her first product? Okay, gift baskets. And then where did she go next? She went to children's blankets and children's clothing, and then she went to large luxury blankets, and then she looked at her margins and her sales and said there's a real opportunity with these real uh, nice luxury blankets. And so she ended up, after four or five years, uh, clearly defining what her business model was that took her to success. And then the last thing we see a lot of, not in all companies, but in a lot of them, that they have a real sense for giving back. Remember what she did? She was. Uh, doing a lot of work, nonprofit work in Cambodia. And uh, so you've probably seen th some of those patterns in the companies that have uh, been represented here. So we're going to hear from Travis. I'm very excited that he's here, and I'm going to have Nicole introduce him. We are super excited to have Travis Chambers here with us today. He has a very impressive career and a lot of experience. He was a solo founder of Chamber Media, which is a company that he built from the ground up. He experienced 100% growth over seven years, and then he sold the company in 2021. And since then, he has founded Chamber Stays, which is an experiential hotel um, business. And it's located in various locations, including Puerto Rico and Utah and Idaho. And they're a true testament to Travis's innovation and creativity. So we're super excited to hear from him tonight. Let's give it up for Travis. Hey, Aggies, where the sagebrush grows. Uh, I have, I, the last time I was on campus was actually on this stage back in, I think it was 2017, so it's been pretty nostalgic to come back. I'm excited for you guys to all come back after you've graduated and feel that nostalgia and some of the things that aren't so fun right now, you'll look back and realize they were more fun than you thought. Um, well, I appreciate you all being here. Um, so what I actually did is, instead of putting a presentation together, I have a lot of videos because that was kind of the nature of my work. And so I thought it'd be a lot more efficient to just post those on my Instagram story uh, because then you could click those links and you could watch the video on silent rather than me sitting here showing you a four minute video, we could use that time to talk about the learnings and the insights from those projects. So my Instagram is Travis underscore Chambers. And uh, I would invite all of you to get out your phones in class <laughs> and to go ahead and uh, follow along with that. Um, so what I wanted to do is a lot of times with these types of uh, these types of things, you'll get, you'll, get, you'll get people who just kind of talk about everything they accomplished and you don't really get much out of it. And so instead what I want to do is I, I do want to talk about the milestones of my career, but I really want the focus to be on what kind of value I can, I can transfer to you. And so what I would like is I would really like for you all to, to think as I tell you some of the things I've done to think, okay, how can I incorporate how he did that into what I'm going to do? And a lot of you are in different industries than me. A lot of you are in finance uh, or, um, uh, you know, uh, international business or 
various types of things. I've, I've kind of always been in the marketing aspect. I ended up obviously being really heavy in business operations. I absolutely hate business operations, but I realized as a true creative, that was for me the only path to, to making the uh, kind of money I wanted to make. Uh, so the first thing I, I really want to share with you is that there is a principle that has been very beneficial for me. It's not the only way to do things, but it's this concept of starting with a service. Uh, and I like to say that if you have maybe an av above average IQ, but not a super high IQ, which is what I am, you know, my SAT scores, I think my ACT was like a, I think it was a 26, 27. It wasn't great. Uh, you know, my grades were decent. Uh, I was just telling Mike, I actually applied for the Huntsman uh, Scholar Program. That's what it was called when I was here. And I got in, and then I couldn't pass calculus. So I had to drop out of the business school and go into the journalism school and do public relations. But that ended up being a great choice because I Preston Parker was, was one of my uh, professors and Troy Oldham. And in public relations, that was kind of a breeding ground for the viral social media uh, explosion, Web 2.0. And so if I would have stayed in the business school, who knows, you know, if I would have learned those journalism uh, kind of press seating t types of thoughts. Um, and that, that's kind of one, that's maybe a pattern of my career that I want to share with you is, is that is really the heart of entrepreneurship. It's what Bob Ross calls happy accidents. You guys, you guys, any guys, raise your hand if you know who Bob Ross is. So Bob Ross has got his easel and he just goes. And it's the ASMR. Yeah, he, he really nailed something with that. But Bob Ross says, oh, we got a happy little accident. So he'll make some kind of mistake with his painting, and then he'll run with it, and that, all of a sudden that thing's a, a beautiful tree, and it's something that really belonged there. And like I told you, I'm not an elite IQ. I couldn't pass calculus, never did, never really excelled at high levels in, in academia. But I was a very persistent dumbass. Um, and, and that's the phrase that I like to say, is there is a place in this world to be very wealthy and successful if you are just a persistent dumbass. And if that's who you are, and not all of you are that way. Some of you are so smart that you're too smart to be doing it the way I did it. But if you don't have a lot of money, and you don't know a lot of people with money, and you don't really have any great ideas, I think that the, the best, highest chance of success is to start with a service. And so you can only start with a service if, if you're really good at something. But if, if you've got a very good skill or a set of skills and you've got a really great work ethic and you've got some experience, you can start selling your time as a freelancer or as a solopreneur. Um, so me, I had, I had just enough experience and just enough credibility to do that. And that insight, start with a service, was the catalyst to everything I've been able to do. And the only way I was able to continue to survive is because I was a persistent dumbass that believed in happy accidents. And as things went wrong, I, I always took my disadvantages and turned them into an advantage. And so... When you're going throughout your entrepreneurial journey, most of your friends that, that are also on that journey, they're gonna, fa they're gonna fall off, they're gonna cave, they're gonna give up, and they're just gonna go get a job. And if you can, if you can really understand that these accidents and disadvantages are where all of your innovation comes from, then you will be able to succeed as a, as a persistent dumbass. Um, so uh, let's get into the story. That, that is the theme I wanted to share with you today. If there was a, a name for this, uh, this dissertation, that, that would be what we would call it. Um, so I'm going to start at the beginning, and I'm going to move very quickly, because I think there's a lot of value in, in having time for questions. 
Um, so the first thing that I did that was entrepreneurial is I put on MMA fights right here in Logan. Uh, there was a movie came out called Warrior, if any of you have seen that, and I was hooked. I was doing jujitsu at some club here on campus, and I was hooked. And so I, I was this miniature Dana White, f literally and figuratively. I was like maybe 140 pounds at the time. And uh, we, we, we filled the, uh, do you guys know the Eccles Ice Arena? So we filled that thing. Actually, our first event was, you guys know that, ca is there's a castle in Hyde Park. Do you guys know that? I don't know. It's like a wedding venue. And uh, the way that we sold out, we did three events, and we sold out all those events. And we had 2,000 people at these MMA fights, and I don't know how many people are in Logan or this valley, 100,000 or whatever. So at some point, like 2 or 3% of the valley was at some underground MMA fight that had never happened in Cache Valley and probably would be pretty terrifying to most people that live here. Um, and and I want to share with you the way that we marketed that. Um, so one thing I did is I, I, I reached out to a ton of students and I said, hey, if, if you will invite 200 people to this Facebook event, I'll give you two tickets for free. Well, before we knew it, we had like 8,000 invitations to the MMA fight page or the Facebook event. The other thing we did is we put out illegal lawn signs. I peppered this whole valley with fight night signs for the Cache Valley Clash. And to my surprise, the, I never got a call from the police. I put out about 200 signs on every major street corner. And my reasoning was, I could either pay for advertising or I could just pay a fine for illegal advertising. And then the third thing I did was also illegal. I flyered uh, every car at every football game, uh, every Utah State football game. Now, I did, get chased, I did get chased by a couple security guards, but by then it was impossible for them to collect two or 3,000 flyers on cars. Um, so I guess the insight there is... Uh, when you're an entrepreneur and you've got nothing going for you, you've got no I mean, my, my rent, I was over at the Sig Ep house, which is, I think, no longer there. But me and two other guys paid $150 a month, and we had bunk beds in a 100-square-foot room. And that thing was full of farts, I could tell you that. The place did not smell good. But I had nothing. I had no money. I had, no, um, I had nothing going for me. We'll just put it that way. Um, and that's how we did it. And that first event, I think it was 800 people showed up and we could only fit 500. We lost some money because we couldn't fit enough people in the venue. But because of all those people that couldn't get in, there was dozens of people standing outside looking through the windows. <clears throat> and because of that, we got all of this attention because people couldn't go. So then I realized this disadvantage is your advantage thing. We had created this exclusive event, <laughs> and our, my, my horrible operations and planning had a benefit to it. And then the next time we did the ice hockey arena, and we sold that out. Now at this time, my dad, was, uh, my dad worked at Monsanto, so he was a uh, national salesman of the year for Roundup. And um, I won't go too, too deep into that, um, but... Uh, um, I was, I was ready to follow his path. I was going to be, I thought that was the way to go. I'm going to be a family man. I'm going to have a nine to five job, just like my dad, who traveled 70, 70 hours a week, was gone all the time, growing. But then when I was 25, he got Parkinson's and divorced. And, um, you know, it came out that Roundup was killing everybody. And that was a wake up to call, call to me. And, and 25 years old is when I realized I was an entrepreneur because I thought, this guy worked his whole life for this corporation that has killed a lot of people. And he didn't know that at the time. But I thought, you know, if I'm going to do something with my life, I want to do something that I at least enjoy or that has some kind of meaning, uh, some kind of purpose to it. But, but I also didn't want to just, right, go surf all day because I wanted to also be wealthy. 
I wanted to do cool things and travel. Um, and so that's what I would share with you is as you're, as you're, as you're using this time at, at school, I, uh, the, by far the most important thing you can do here is not the skills you gain, it's not the things you learn. What you really should be spending your time at, at school doing is researching the industry that you want to be in. And I, I really feel like as I look back at my peers here at Utah State, they didn't spend near enough time on that, but I was obsessed with that. And so you don't even really, the, the, here's the problem, is I, I did all these career uh, tests and personality tests. I think I took a whole semester of a class actually on co career planning, whatever. The problem is the focus is always on your personality and what job that you should be in. But what if you're not supposed to be in a job? You know, what if you're not supposed to be a cog in a machine for 40 years and retire? There's never been a better time in history to be an entrepreneur. You've got the internet. You've got unlimited access to all information. You've got unlimited access to 95% of people. There's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur. And as time goes on, it gets easier and easier to do it. And so that's, that's the thing I want to share with you is don't worry so much about your, 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 your job. Oh, I'm going to get a degree in business management, and then I'm going to go get a job at uh, Micron, you know. Instead, what you want to do is you want to you really think about what industry do you want to go into. Because industry is what matters. A job is a job. You know, you could get a job in any industry, and I'll tell you this, a lot of industries aren't good. Um, you don't want to be in the paper industry. Do you want to work at Dunder Mifflin and be a paper sales? And then what I'm trying to tell you is, if you're in business and you're like, I think I'm going to go into sales, you might end up at Dunder Mifflin. And you may be living that sitcom uh, where, who's the, guy, who's the guy that's like too smart to be there? Is it Tom? What's his name? Jim. You don't want to end up like Jim. Bright guy, but chose the wrong industry. Chose to get into the paper business. And so y'all need to really spend as much time as you're studying in school of studying industries. Where, where is the world heading? Is it renewable energy? Is it augmented reality? Is it AI? Is it... Uh, what manufacturing processes are, are happening now? And that, that was a big realization for me when I was at Utah State. Preston made me sign up for Twitter in 2009. And I thought, this is the dumbest thing I have ever heard of. We're going we're gonna to do these little 140-character tweets. I don't want to tweet. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a frat bro. I don't want to be tweeting. That's not the thing I want to do. But I'm glad he made me do it because I was in the journalism school. And, and in that time, journalism was dying. And uh, journalists weren't making any money because of the internet. And that's when Web 2.0 web exploded, Facebook and YouTube and, and all of these different things. And so I chose an industry. And I would say 100% of my success has, has become from that one decision. So when you're choosing an industry, try to choose something that is in its early stages. You don't want to be in an old growth industry. You know, here's the reason why. Is I wanted to be in TV, I wanted to be in television, I wanted to be in media and entertainment and all those things. Well, when I got to the agency in LA, I realized that you have to climb your way to the top. And at that time, television was starting to decrease. When I started my career, 3% of all media consumed in the United States was social media. And four years later, it was 50%. And, and that's how I was able to advance every year. I was able to go from social media supervisor at Crispin Porter and Bogusky in LA to social media director of 20th Century Fox at age 25. If I had stayed in TV or, 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 or anything else, that would have taken till 35. And, uh, you know, at first that, that, that second job at Crispin Porter was 80 grand. 
And that, that third job at 20th Century Fox was 120 grand. And that's what, that's what teed me up for all the things that uh, I ended up doing. Um, so like I said, your disadvantage is your advantage. The unlucky things that happen to you are showing you an opportunity. And something a little unlucky happened to me and my wife when we were here on campus. We had a viral video in which I looked like a jerk and she looked not super bright. Uh, and it's called The Real Meaning of MPH. It's on the story, if you guys want to see it. We were on Tosh.0. Oh, we were on Good Morning America. We were on World's Dumbest uh, on uh, True TV. And we made about $60,000 from all of that stuff. We did licensing fees. We had a clo clothing deal. And it was just me and my wife having a conversation like we have all the time because we just like to argue about stupid stuff. And she does this dumb blonde impression, and she just does it all the time, and it's hilarious. And I recorded it and, and, and sent it to her brother, and her brother posted it on YouTube, and it went viral. And I, I issued a national apology on Good Morning America to my wife. <laughs> uh, so it was a tough thing. Um, you know, some, of, some people weren't very happy about it. Uh, her godmother was not very happy about it. I'll tell you that. But we got through it. We made some money, paid off all of our student loans, paid off our cars. And uh, Kraft Mac and Cheese reached out to license the video. And I had on my vision board that I was going to work at Crispin Ford and Bogusky, which was the top creative agency in L.A. They're the ones that did, you guys are too young to remember this, but us older people. There was a point where Domino's Pizza had a big turnaround. They came out and said, our pizza sucks but we made it better. Um, and they, they, this, this agency was behind like the coolest campaigns. There was a, a creepy Burger King King, uh, some incredible stuff. And, and that was on my vision board. And lo and behold, Kraft Mac and Cheese reaches out to license this video from Crispin Ford and Bogusky. And I said, look, I'll let, you, I'll let you have this video for free. I'll save you like $400. <laughs> but you gotta give me an interview. And they gave me an interview, they flew me out to Boulder, Colorado, before I knew it, we were in LA, in the dream job, at the dream agency. So, happy accidents. Uh, <clears throat> so I became the in-house viral video, baby, you know, up-and-comer guy at uh, Crispin Ford and Bogusky. And they put me on Old Navy, they put me on Trisket, A1 Steak Sauce, uh, Vitamin Water. And I was a glorified social media poster. <laughs> I mean, I was literally just writing posts, telling graphic designers what to make, and then posting it. And during that time, I took Old Navy from 2 million to 8 million Facebook likes, which now is completely useless. Uh, Facebook likes have no value at this point. But uh, I, I, I really was, was so obsessed with this viral video thing because of what had happened to us. And I saw the power in it. And this is when Devin Supertramp was getting big, Lindsey Sterling was getting big. These were the early days of viral YouTube. And I was so fascinated with the fact that someone could put out a piece of media and that no one could stop you. You didn't have to get anyone's permission. You didn't have to get a TV show or, and it sounds crazy to you guys probably to hear this now because when you grow up with that, you don't even think about that. But back then it was, the social media, this web 2.0 movement was like this liberating democratic movement where everyone could be creative whenever they wanted to be. You could post whatever you wanted on YouTube. And, and have a career out of it. And Justin Bieber blew up from it. And Taylor Swift blew up from it. And all these exciting, it was so exciting. Um, and then it got not exciting. And that's when I decided to sell my company, which I'll get to. But eight months later, okay, I'm 24 years old. I look 18. I looked 18 until about two years ago. I got just bald enough and just wrinkly enough. Uh, and my voice just got just grovelly and, and worn out enough to not look and sound like I was maybe 15 years old. And uh, Turkish Airlines walks in, 
and they say, we want to make the most viral ad of all time, and we've got Kobe Bryant and Lionel Messi, and I'm just sitting there like, what? Okay. So I, I went in there, and I broke a lot of rules. I did a lot of things I wasn't supposed to. Um, I went to a meeting I wasn't invited to, and I stood up in that meeting I wasn't invited to, and just started telling them my ideas. This is a room of about 15 people. This is the president, owner of the 800-person agency. This is uh, legal. This is Turkish Airlines clients. Most of these people in this room don't even know who I am. And I stand up and I say, if you guys try to do this with Creative Alone, you're going to fail. And they're like, who is this 14-year-old just barely got out of puberty guy trying to tell us about what we're going to do? But I had a presentation ready. And they actually watched the presentation. I just hijacked this meeting. And the presentation was proving to them that no video with Kobe or Messi in it had ever done more than 2 million views on YouTube. For Adidas, for Nike. I mean, these are two, $3 million productions. And they, they, they got it. They're like, holy crap, this, this kid knows what he's talking about. So they gave me $3 million. And the, the TV campaign was $21 million. And we did a campaign with viral seeding. We did the largest influencer activation of all time. 650 influencers were talking about this. I had, uh, we had uh, vendors that had like 20 interns in different languages. We were set to 8,000 publications and 2,000 of them featured our work. We did all this really crazy wizardry. And, and all the vendors I hired were from Utah, by the way. And so we had this little secret viral Utah thing going on. That was really cool. And the video got 140 million views, 3 million shares. Um, it, it outperformed the $21 million TV spend by 4x. And it was incredible. Um, and I almost got fired. Uh, Legal, legal, we did, my boss let me do pretty much everything with no legal approval. Um, and fortunately, we did everything right. We did all our FTC disclosures correctly. Because Xbox did the, tried to do the same thing about two months later, and their influencers didn't disclose that it was an ad, and they lost a $20 million lawsuit with the FTC. But they couldn't fire me. It, the thing did what it was supposed to do. I was writing checks I didn't have authority to write, and... Signing invoices, I didn't have authority to sign. And then 20th Century Fox called. And they said, hey, why don't you come lead social media here? And that only lasted three months. Um, I flew a little close to the sun, thought I was real hot, knew what I was doing. But in the, in the Hollywood business, I just, I got wrecked. I got laid, I, I didn't do well, I got laid off, I couldn't navigate. And so I, I've been laid off. For some reason, they gave me three months severance. I don't know why you get three months severance after working somewhere for three months. But I did. It was about $15,000. And I thought, OK, I've got three months to make a run at this entrepreneurship thing. It was right around the time I'd had my first child. Dad got Parkinson's and divorced. And I just realized, man, life is short. And so I started Chamber Media. I, had, I paid $70 for a business license, and I had a laptop. And I started sneaking into, uh, I started sneaking into parties at VidCon. Uh, I got Logan Paul's phone number. I got, I got a lot of YouTubers' phone numbers. PewDiePie. And then I just started. Um, then I got contacted with with brands. I'd network into brands, and I'd get them these these brand deals, these brand integrations, with these influencers. Um, but then tech started kind of taking that over, so I kind of switched to ad buying and video production. The problem is I didn't know anything about how to make a video. I didn't know anything about how to make film. But I did tell people, I told people that I did though. And I leveraged the Kobe versus Messi thing as if, you know, um, I knew what I was doing. But I said, you know, I never knew what I was doing in the first place with any of this stuff. I didn't know what I was doing when we did the Kobe versus Messi campaign. I didn't know what I was doing with the MMA fight. But I just decided I'd figure it out. And uh, our credit cards were maxed out at the end of three months, and we got a $60,000 client. 
And then we get another client, and we get another client. And uh, eventually, uh, Nordic Track reached out. And it was, a, it was a fellow student from Utah State who had moved up to director of marketing at Nordic Track. His name is Jeremy Neff. And I owe a lot of my career to this one thing that happened. And I went there and I pitched, and I had the Kobe versus Messi thing, and we had a couple other successes. And they, they gave us $180,000. So I went and I got 50 treadmills, and I filled a barn here in Logan with 50 treadmills, got 12 influencers there, and we did the world's largest treadmill dance. And it did really well. Uh, I think it got a few million views. It did a few million dollars in sales. Um, it made it on the Ellen Show, uh, and also made it on God, America's Got Talent. Our treadmill dancers went on America's Got Talent. They they actually got moved forward, and then America's Got Talent realized that there was Nordic Track huge logos on these treadmills that no one, that they, but they weren't getting paid for this free advertising, so they cut the act after that. But that was the catalyst. Now I had two or three case studies. And that's another thing I want to share with you. In your entrepreneurial journey, if you have two or three case studies, you're in business. Now, it's a matter of, is it going to take you two months to get those case studies, or is it going to take you two years? In my case, it took almost two years. Two years of struggle bus to do that. But once you get to that point, people will believe in you. And even now, even now, I'm starting over again in this hotel construction and hospitality industry. And when I talk to bankers and hedge funds and family offices, they look at me like I am totally nuts. Because I've got two small boutique hotels that aren't open yet. And you got to have two or three case studies. And once those hotels are open, then we'll, people will be begging us to be a part of it. And that's the way this thing goes. No one's going to give you money until you got two or three case studies. So you got to find a way to convince some people to give you an opportunity. Now, I'm on this slide now, and it just shows you some of the stuff we did with Chamber Media. Um, we, we, we ended up uh, driving about $800 million in sales. Um, in 2021, we made 35,000 videos for brands. We had 100 employees. We had 25,000 square feet of film studio. I, on my vision board, I had Rob Dyrdek's Fantasy Factory. If you guys know who Rob Dyrdek is. Or has, how many of you have seen Fantasy Factory? Damn, dang, I'm getting old, guys. I'm irrelevant. He was really cool, though, back in 2016. Anyways, we had this factory. We were pumping out all these videos. Uh, you guys can see on the slide there, that's our team. We grew from 3 million to 14 million in about 18 months. So the first three years of Chamber Media, I didn't have a lot of budget. Um, first year, we did 650 grand, then 1.2, then 1.5, then 2 million, then 3 million a year. And that was all from networking. I would go to conferences. I would sneak into various at one point, I had a sticker that said I was the vice president of Hulu, and that got me into everywhere. Every conference I went to, I was the vice president of Hulu. I just took some guy's name off of LinkedIn, and I, would just, I just figured this guy would be on the list for every single thing, and I'd just walk in. And I'd sit with these brands. I'd talk to them about what we were doing. But the, the insight there, right, just like the MMA fight is – I just grinded. I did the guerrilla marketing approach. And I'll just tell you this. There is no easy approach. There is no lever you can pull. And if someone else does it for you, they're going to be your boss. And if, if you want to really succeed at entrepreneurship, you are going to have to do the dirty, difficult stuff. Unless you're in finance, then it's easy. Uh, if you're in finance, you're, you can just raise capital and I don't know, finance guys walk circles around me. Uh, they're just, the whole world is run by finance. So if there's one thing I would do differently, I would have I taken some finance classes. And that would be a big recommendation I have for you. Even if you hate math and you hate finance like I do, you still got to learn it. Because if you can raise capital, you are not have to work as hard as I did to do all this stuff. Um, we built a tech software called The Brain. 
the chamber brain. We actually built it on top of GPT about four years ago. So you guys know ch uh, chat GPT, right? We were on, I think, GPT-2. And some guy, in, um, some guy in some Eastern European country, I can't remember where, he somehow got access, he got us access to this GPT thing. So we built a, we built it, uh, a layer on top of it that would write ad copy for you. And then what we did is we scraped all of the top performing ads on Facebook. We wrote this code and we crawled their software, which is also illegal, by the way. And we built this database of the, hi the highest performing ads. Um, now, we never, we never mentioned that we crawled Facebook, and we never said, told people we had access to this data. We just said, hey, we have studied a lot of ads, uh, and we ourselves had like 40,000 ads in our database. And we were able to find out which ads work. And so this brain software all of a sudden made Chamber Media like we had God mode for ads. And that's another insight I would share for you. Is, is you gotta study, you gotta study what's working in the industry, right? How everyone in their in their dog has an ad agency, right? Everybody who's got nothing starts an agency. And so the second that we applied research to our industry, we became the leader. All of a sudden, I was getting asked to speak at conferences rather than begging to speak at conferences. And all of a sudden, I was getting into these events with my own name tag. It, it was because we had finally become a credible thought leader in the space. And, and I'm telling you guys this. You could do this now. You could go study solar energy right now. You could go uh, study the AI industry. Get obsessed with it and try to predict what's going to happen and insert yourself into that role. And, and if you can do that, you will, you will be able to aggregate a lot of resources. Now, what we found out was that there was seven categories of ads that, that were the, the most high performing. We had some VA, VAs in the Philippines uh, categorize 80,000 ads based on um, the length, what type of ad they were, were there actors in it, was there not? And what popped out was spokesperson videos, product demos, social proof ads, dynamic ads, case studies, lifestyle ads, and unboxing. So we were able to take these seven types of ads, and I was able to take um, what I would call maybe low, lesser experienced videographers, a lot of wedding videographers, for example, and I was able to get them to make ads at a very high level simply through this research. So if, if they weren't at a creative ability to be able to make an ad that was going to sell, we now had like a Bible. We had a format. We had a, a taxonomy for them. Uh, we had a process. And it, it wasn't that much different really than how McDonald's has gotten middle eight, mid, uh, minimum wage people to, to run a whole store. Uh, that's something that should be really complicated, but they've built systems and processes to make that possible. So there's another insight for you. If you want, if you want to be really successful and you want to help a lot of people, learn how to help people uh, do things that are above their skill level or above their experience level. Help them develop because that's probably just one of the laws of the universe. If you help people grow, you, it will return back to you. And what's been so exciting to see is all the high performers at Chamber Media have gone on to do these incredible things. And um, when, you, when you're an entrepreneur and you start a company, that's why you're doing it. It's, it's not even about the industry. Sometimes it's not about the mission. I mean, I was making ads selling people stuff they don't need. I don't, I don't know if I was raking the world a better place, if I'm being honest with you. But we made ads that were funny. We tried to make ads that didn't you know, make you feel less than, but related with your pain to, to buy the thing. But what I focused on was the team. And we had this phrase, it was people before profits. It was a really horrible ide ideology for making money, but it was a great ideology for, for trying to do something that was more important than money. And uh, over and over again, we made decisions. You know, there were many times where we should have done layoffs. 
And I just said, you know, let's not. Let's not do layoffs. Let's just survive this. And it forced us to innovate. When we had uh, 12 employees, we had one client get really ticked off, and they had referred us three other clients, and they convinced all those clients to fire us. And I couldn't afford uh, our payroll so from, from the business. So I took my own personal income, and, and we funded those salaries for a few months. That's when we rolled out the micro video program. It forced us to innovate, and that micro video program was, was the reason we went from $3 million a year to $14 million a year. And then we started running ads. And at the time, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to run ads to sell ads. If you think of it, it's like a really weird concept. No advertising agencies ran ads at that time. But when we had a lower-priced offering and we had a system that could allow junior people to deliver, deliver work like a senior person, and we had all these case studies, we were able to run ads, and it actually worked. And we went from 12 employees to 100 employees in like a year and a half, which was wild. It was really wild. I wasn't prepared for that. Um, another insight is when I started the company, I decided to start premium because I didn't have a team. I didn't have a lot of uh, infrastructure. I would basically sell some type of project by pitching some kind of creative and some kind of strategy, and then I would hire contractors and vendors to help me execute. So that's another thing I would tell you is when you start with a service and you're selling your time, if you want to amplify and scale yourself, you don't have to have employees. You can use contractors and vendors to do that. Um, and so when we started, we only sold stuff that was $60,000 and up. And I thought, we've got to do five or six projects a year because we just can't handle more than that. And so because of that, we started out premium. Now, uh, that's, that's the same thing that Elon Musk did with Tesla. He came out with the Roadster first. The Roadster was, I can't remember how much it was. It was like 150000 or more. So he came up with a really fast race car first. And he was able to sell a very low volume of that vehicle in order to get his uh, scale of manufacturing, his economies of scale, so that he could build lower cost cars. So I would say that is when you start a service, you actually want to do the opposite of what you would think. You want to start out expensive. And in order to do that, you usually need to go get a job first. Go get a job, but don't just be a cog in the wheel. Don't just fill a warm seat. Because 80% of people at companies are just cogs. They're just there to do one job. And, and, and a lot of times the organization doesn't want them to do anything else. They want to hand the ball to the high performers. And if you're a high performer, it involves a lot of risk, especially if you look like you're 15 years old. And so sometimes you cannot wait for permission to do things. If you really, really want to, 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 to do things that you want to do. Um, but that's, that's the way you can get there. I think it's great to go work at a really large corporation or in a startup because you need to understand the industry. I think there's this trend right now of like, well, I don't need anything like that because I've got the internet. I can just sell something online. I'll build a course. But until you've been in the industry, it's really hard to, to picture what's in there. And everyone who runs these companies, they make all of their money off of predicting the future of industry. The smartest people on earth are hedge fund managers. And all hedge fund managers do all day is predict the future. That's all they do. And they do it by studying the industry. Warren Buffett is one of the richest people on earth because he just read the, the New York, uh, what did he read? What's, what's the, what's, you guys know what I'm talking about. What is it? What is the main stock Wall Street newspaper? Wall Street Journal. There it is. He, he read the Wall Street Journal religiously for 60 years. So Warren Buffett woke up, and the first thing he did every morning was study the industry. And once you see these events happen enough, you start to realize that history repeats itself. So you guys see the link on here for the world's largest treadmill dance. Uh, and the next one is a link for Mr. Cool. 
So when we were doing $3 million a year, and we just launched this micro video program, and we just launched these ads, and I was really getting exhausted of speaking at conferences and sneaking into places I wasn't supposed to be. Um, our competitor, the Harmon Brothers, uh, gave us a lead that they didn't have time for. And it was Mr. Cool. It was do-it-yourself AC units. And they gave it to us because they didn't think that, that it was going to work. And we took it because uh, we would take anything. <laughs> And uh, we made this ad for Mr. Cool, and this ad has done over $400 million in sales. And that case study really catapulted us. Um, now another insight I'll share is I would go to these conferences, and I was trying to get leads. I was trying to get customers. And whenever they would ask me what I did for a living, and I'd say, well, I make, I make videos, and I, I do Facebook ads their eyes would just gloss over. The, the joy in their life would just leave the room, and they just couldn't wait to get away from me. But after going through that experience hundreds of times of networking, introducing myself, one day I said, well, we've tripled the revenue of three multi-million dollar companies in the last two years. And the joy came back into their eyes, and all of a sudden they wanted to talk. That's the messaging that we used in our ads, and uh, those ads have drove over $30 million for, for, uh, for Chamber Media. And I guess that's an insight as well, is you gotta practice what you preach. You cannot be the doctor who smokes. If, if you're an ad agency, you better make ads. If you're a roofing company, you better have a nice roof on your house. If you're a mechanic, you better have some sweet car that is a race car or a classic car. But yet, you know what? Mechanics cars always look like crap. Have you ever noticed that? And it's because when you do the thing, you don't really want to do the thing outside of the, wor the work. But we ran ads as an ad agency, and all of a sudden, people see our ads, and they thought, geez, if these guys are running ads to me to convince me to run ads, they must be pretty good at ads. And then they hired us. And now all the e-commerce ads uh, agencies run ads. And a lot of them run ads that are very similar to the ones that we ran. The next thing ha happened that was on my vision board was Forbes 30 under 30. Uh, raise your hand if you've got a vision board right now. Raise your hand if you have a vision board that's on your mirror. Get that thing on your mirror, guys. Uh, I wasn't very athletic in high school. I wanted to go to state in any sport. I did not care what it was, so I picked the least competitive sport of swimming. And I picked the least competitive stroke, which is 100-yard breaststroke. Because I thought, I gotta go the path of least resistance here. I'm 130 pounds, I'm, I'm not gonna make it any other sport. I wasn't coordinated enough in tennis. <laughs> so I did, I made it to state. Um, and the, the only reason is because I put that time on my mirror. And so I became obsessed with that time. And somehow, someway, it happened. So I would recommend to all of you tonight, have a vision board. Go on Pinterest, get some pictures of what you want to happen for you, and get that on your mirror and reset it every single year. And if you do it religiously, you become obsessed with it. All of a sudden, after a few years, you'll start realizing, oh my gosh, 70% of this stuff actually happened. And all you got to do is be a persistent dumbass. So I think I was 28 or 29. Time was running out for this Forbes 30 under 30 dream. And I wasn't necessarily taking over the world. I owned a Facebook ads industry. I wasn't, it wasn't like I was a software engineer or some genius hedge fund. I was just another ad guy. You know what I mean? So I leaned into that. My disadvantage was my advantage. And so I called every influencer I had ever met and had ever hired in every film shoot, and I said, hey. And by the way, when you, when you get on the Forbes 30, someone has to nominate you. You can't just go nominate yourself. So I, I reached out to the most famous influencer I said, and I said, hey, I filled out this nomination. Can I say it was from you? And it was Laura Clary. 
And she said, yeah, of course. And I said, will you tweet that you nominated me? She's like, yes, of course. So she tweeted that. She, men she mentioned the Forbes writers. And then I got a bunch of un other influencers to do that. So all of a sudden, I was not ever going to be on this list, but all these journalists were getting peppered with tweets about some random guy that made Facebook ads. And they do check your tax returns, they do check your P&L statements, um, and they do look at your revenue. So you do have to, you know, you have to be doing something noteworthy to get on there. And lo and behold, I made it. I was shocked. And I went to the Forbes conference, and I wrote an article on here on exactly how that all went down, if any of you guys are curious. I know all of you guys want to be on that list. And you can't tell me you don't. You might say you don't, but deep down inside, you're like, oh, man. If I could be on the Forbes 30 list, my mom would be so proud of me. My dad would finally love me. Just kidding. My dad loves me. He's great. Um, I also hacked LinkedIn. So I, I did a lot of organic LinkedIn posts, and that's how we got from 2 million to 3 million in revenue. And I just really studied that algorithm. I, I really tried to figure out how can I write stories that entrepreneurs will respond to. Uh, there was one article in particular called Having Children Destroyed My Career. And that one went bonkers. And we got so many leads from that. And it was, a ne I, I studied this kind of these gimmicks. I figured out that negative headlines do really well. So I wrote a negative headline about an article about how wonderful it is to have children and how it, having children made me want to be an entrepreneur and how that led to all these great things. So all these people got clickbaited by this negative headline, and then they just got this positive, warm, fuzzy LinkedIn article from it. But that's when I started to understand the power of personal branding. Now, I had been pushing chamber media so hard, and no one cared. And one day, I started pushing Travis Chambers. Instead of running ads from Chamber Media account, I ran it from the Travis Chambers account. And all of a sudden, I noticed a shift. And it was because I was connecting with entrepreneurs one-on-one. -on -one. And I realized how personal business is when you're in the service business. People want to do business with the owner. They want to do business with the founder, not the brand. And I actually think that in the 90s and the early 2000s, brand marketing was king. Red Bull, right? Coca-Cola. The, these are household brands, but it's shifted. Web 2.0 has shifted the brand to the person. And you, in a lot of spaces, it's not the right decision for everyone, but in a lot of industries, you can, you can do three lifetimes of stuff in one lifetime if you are able to build your personal brand. It is the reason that Elon Musk is such a juggernaut. It's because his brand is massive. And he, if you've read his book, he was obsessive about press. Richard Branson is another one. Love him or hate him, I don't, I'm not political, but Donald Trump. You got Trump Stakes, Trump University, Trump, what else we got? Stakes, University, Trump Airlines. Most of them are, are uh, out of business now, but Trump Hotel. Uh, he's just done a really great job at personal branding. He was so good at it, he became president. So... And there's other guys, too. you got Bloomberg. you got Huffington. You've got uh, Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, you've got Scarlett Johansson now who's doing it. And, and Ryan Reynolds. And if you guys notice, like, Ryan Reynolds is a bigger brand than Mint Mobile. He's a bigger brand than, than Aviation Gin. And now he's a billionaire. So this personal branding thing is, is really important. Uh, I posted this article for you guys. I'm not going to go through it, but it's called... 14 business things I wish I'd known in my early 20s from a fellow millennial. I'd highly recommend reading that. That's just everything I've, I've ever learned that I wish I knew when I was in my early 20s. And then we got to the Chamber Media exit. Um, I got really sick and tired of running Chamber Media because it was 100 employees. I, I don't enjoy operations. I enjoy innovation and sales and creativity. And I wasn't being able to be creative anymore. I didn't have time to write scripts. I didn't have time to direct commercials. I didn't have time to build sets and pick wardrobe and do casting calls and, and uh, choose actors. 
And that stuff is fun. That's a dream. That's a kid's dream that I was getting to live. And I no longer had time to do it because I was just dealing with everyone's problems all the time. And that was my fault. I wasn't good at training a team that would protect me from all of those problems. I, I was just always trying to go in and save everything. So I, uh, I, I went to a broker, and we put Chamber Media on the market, and we took an offer for $17 million, um, which is really crazy for an ad agency, for a service business that has no assets, has no IP, and has nothing but a team of people. But some manufacturing uh, private equity firm in the, in, the, in the Midwest wanted to diversify their portfolio after COVID, uh, and they wanted something in the e-commerce uh, online space. And their offer was the, the, best, the second best offer. They had the second best money offer, but the first best terms. So we sold that company. I still own 20% of it. Um, and I took that capital and I put it into the next dream, which was making experiential immersive stays. I wanted to get back to that creative place. And I thought, you know, I, I, I want to make music. I want to do design. I want to do filmmaking. I want to do architecture. I want to do all these creative things to the max, most maximum capacity possible. And I thought, what is the biggest paintbrush I could get? What is the biggest canvas I could get? So I bought 240 acres of useless land in the desert in the middle of nowhere and started building. And we built this, we built this weird Burning Man, Mad Max, Star Wars hotel. I don't know what it is. It's an ADHD explosion. I hope some of you get to see it. We've got caves. We've got reflective one-way mirrored cubes. We've got, uh, when you get into your room, there's costumes waiting for you. There's wardrobe. There's a podcast as you drive to the property that tells you this made-up story about this planet and these people. Uh, there's uh, sand cruisers. They're like jet speeders we built on golf, court, go golf cart chassis. And there's a theme park driving tour. It's two miles along, two miles long across the property with signs. At one point, you're digging for selenite crystals. At one point, you're throwing an hat ladle. At one point, you're, you're blowing some huge Carnix battle horn. And, and it's an immersive experience. And uh, basically, the premise is, can we make a hotel that makes you feel like you're in a movie or you're in a simulation, makes you feel like you're in a theme park, but you have the whole place to yourself and you're the main character. Um, so we built this concept, and all we had was the land, and we had utilities, and, and we had a conditional use permit. We had permission to do this from the county. And so we launched an Indiegogo campaign, and, and the hotel sold out in three days for the hotel that wasn't built yet. And we ran ads, and we did a VIP uh, mechanic where people could pay $50 to reserve their spot to book at a discount later on. So we ran $200,000 in ads in, a, in about a six-week period in like a 500-mile radius, which is a really big spend for the small region. At Chamber Media, we, we spent like hundred grand a month, and we did about a million in sales a month. So to spend 200 grand in like a fifth of that radius was really heavily concentrated. The reach was insane. We got like a few dozen press features. I was at Utah Tech Week a couple weeks ago, and it must have been 40 or 50 people came up asking about Outpost X. I haven't met. And so this thing kind of really caught on. And now we're two weeks from opening. So I just drove from there to here. We're two weeks from opening. Hopefully people like it. I've had some guests and, and, and people come, and they, they seem to like it. And uh, we've got one in Puerto Rico as well called Naledi Village and Outpost X. That's the hotel. This fictional story, the story connects to the hotel in Puerto Rico as well. And as we build more and more of these, these, these are all going to have some filmmaking kind of link between them. Um, so I'm trying to kind of invent a category that doesn't exist yet. And when we started Chamber Media, we were one of the first companies to take film production and media buying and put it under one company. So we did something that just wasn't usual. We did something that was, uh, 
Well, that was just new, right? And so that's what we're trying to do with the hotels. And uh, time will tell if that was the way to go. And then since then, I've been also be doing retreats for, for networking, the personal branding thing. But um, that's, that's kind of my story, guys. And I hope I was able to at least break down some insights uh, from those stories that are, are usable for you. Uh, and uh, really appreciate it uh, if, we have time for, if we have time for questions. Three, I'll do three questions. I took too much time, guys. I rambled. I think I would have hired more expensive people as my executives. Uh, I think that uh, I, I didn't spend enough. And I, I hired people who were really good at making ads, but weren't good at managing a large group of people. So I probably would have gone to, uh, I, w I would have gotten some MBA or uh, so, some someone who's just really a genius at management, uh, and I think that would have helped a lot. I was never a big uh, course or like how to studier type person. I just always preferred to learn by failing and trying. But the books that did set me on this path were kind of more theory type books. Um, and those books were, th there were three books that completely changed my life. I read all three of them when I was 25 during this. I had my early midlife crisis at 25. And it was The Hundred Dollar Startup. Uh, it was The Four Day Work Week. And Trust Me, I'm Lying, Confessions from a Man Media Manipulator from Ryan Holiday. So that's the $100 startup, four-day work week, and trust me, I'm lying, Confessions of a Media Manipulator by Ryan Holiday. I don't know why he made that book title so long, but the book did really well. He, he spray-painted billboards in protest of a movie that he was promoting because it was like a really controversial movie, and he got every press outlet in America to to cover this fake protest that he engineered. So he was kind of like a legend in the press seating kind of world. So none of those were like criminally illegal. Uh, like you can't go to jail for flying cars. You can't go to jail for putting out lawn signs. You can't get, go to jail for sneaking into an event you're not supposed to be in. Uh, what else illegal did we do? What else? So signatures, that was not illegal. Uh, that was just more so like I didn't have approval to, to approve those invoices. So you don't go to jail for that either. I don't know. Maybe I could have actually <laughs> now that you say that. But anyways, these were all fine related offenses. You get fined for lawn signs. You get fined for, you don't, nothing happens to you for going be somewhere you're not supposed to go. They just kick you out. But my whole point in that is, I may have over-exaggerated the illegal part, but my whole insight I wanted to share with you is that sometimes you have to break the rules in order to innovate, you know? And sometimes the rules are, in a lot of cases, are not, um, I don't know, maybe don't matter. I don't know. I went and picked up all the lawn signs after three days. Uh, I don't know if anyone was hurt by those flyers, but I don't know. Take it for what it's worth. Oh, was that the three questions? Okay. Thanks, guys. I know my presentations are a little wild, but thank you.